Um, okay, so let's go ahead and, and get started. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk about this kind of work here, here with, with all of you in this programming, just to, to get your perspective on the work that we've done so far, but also because I think that this area of research is really uh, a little bit outside of the traditional sort of applications of NLP. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today is not is not one of the, the big areas like machine translation or question answering, but rather about the ways in which we can see NLP effectively as being a kind of algorithmic measuring device about the world. All right, so to use these techniques that we've been developing, to use these kind of models that we want to build in order to take measurements about some phenomena that exist, in order to understand what exactly uh, these measurements are telling us about these specific things. Now, this is not a new area of research. Right? There's a lot of other work that has arisen over the past 10 years in particular, or we gained in popularity over the past 10 years, that's looked at NLP at the intersection of the social sciences, right, to give rise to communities of practice like computational social science, computational journalism, and also the computational humanities. But what I'm gonna be talking about here is a, is a very specific application of NLP to understanding depicted worlds, right, or imagined worlds, right, these, these treating objects of culture as being our primary object of study. And this is important for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, for all of us, a culture is very pervasive in how we experience the world, right? Whether we're talking about the books that we read, the TV shows that we watch, the music that we listen to, in many ways, the experience that we have with the world is mediated through these kinds of information sources. Now, if we think about NLP, right, the ways in which NLP has used fiction in particular, I think it really comes down to the two really big divides, right? On the one hand, we see a lot of models that are using fiction as a source of data, right? So um, the book Corpus is one great example of that, right? So everybody at this point is familiar with BERT and models uh, and the data on which BERT is drawn, right? So BERT has been trained on all of English Wikipedia and uh, about 9,000 self-published works in the book Corpus. Uh, so it has a really good understanding about how fiction is depicted as a result of these design choices for using fiction as a source of data. We also see fiction being used for question answering and narrative QA. Uh, we see it being used in the five sentence common sense stories right, that Nazri and Mosafazda and others had created a couple of years ago. Right? So if we want to understand the ordering in which sentences appear that define the narrative, this gives us a way of understanding that and modeling that. And of course, we've all also had the Google Book Corpus around for 10 years now at this point, and this has given rise to a lot of studies in historical linguistics in understanding word sense change over the course of two centuries, for example. And fiction, of course, is a really strong presence within this Google Books Corpus. So on the one hand, we see NLP interacting with fiction as a source of data for training models that either care about modeling fiction or are just using it to get a better, richer representation of the world. On the other hand, we see at a work in LP using fiction to explicitly model literary phenomena. And that includes my own work from years ago on modeling character types. It includes other work on, on trying to model the relationships between characters in fiction. Uh, it includes work uh, over the past 10 years uh, of different kinds that's tried to model plot essentially as a form as a distribution of sentiment over the narrative time of a novel, and it includes more recent work on trying to understand and model the, the agency, the, the, the psychology, and the power that individual characters are expressing within a given narrative. So on both sides, we see this work being presented at NLP venues, right? Work that treats fiction as data, work that explicitly tries to model uniquely literary phenomena. But one thing that you may not, one area of research, that you may not be as exposed to is this much bigger sphere of the computational humanities and cultural analytics, right? So I give on this slide a, a handful of some of my favorite work in this space, uh, but just to give you a sense about what how this work interacts with NLP. I just want to briefly mention two or, or point out two of these works. Uh, Ted Underwood's work on why literary time is measured in minutes, which takes the problem of trying to predict for a given 500 word span of text, how much time is elapsing within that paragraph, right? Is it, is it one minute? Is it an hour? Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it 10 years, right? This is essentially an NLP problem, right? That tries to understand and model that relationship between text and some external prediction, like a real number denoting the amount of time that passage. And once we have a model that can do this, there's lots of interesting questions that all of a sudden become available 
right, and understanding exactly how time you know, uh, interacts with this structure of events, for example. Even on a much simpler scale, Holtz Kotzma's work on loudness in the, in the novel uh, takes a very simple measurement of just how loud a verb of speaking is, right? So if you, if you build a dictionary that says that the, the verb saying has a neutral loudness of a score of five, for example, whispering has a score of one and shouting has a score of 10. Well, once we have this very simple mapping between verbs of speaking and their loudness, what we can do is build a model for how loud part, specific parts of a novel are and how loud individual authors are. Again, having a relationship between the text that's being expressed and some external signal that we may care about measuring. All of this work in this space examines models and, and uh, models of text in a very similar way to get at some kind of knowledge about the, the fundamental literary problem behind all of these. Now, what I want to talk about today is this, this bigger question that a lot of these, this work in the computational humanities is trying to use NLP to get to. All right, how do we go about designing NLP to drive insight in literary text? All right, how can we go about designing models that are, that are specifically designed to answer a specific question that tells us something new about literature. All right, on the one hand, we have people who, who really know how to build NLP models well. We also have people who know what good questions are to ask uh, the, on the literary side. So how do we bring these two together to actually derive new insight? Now, to get to this point, I want to talk about how we go about getting there, right? how we go about building these kinds of models that actually work well for literature. And one thing that I want to stress here is that while a lot of work in NLP now has been moving more toward end-to-end -to -end systems, right, to take some, some task that you want to solve at the very end, like co-reference resolution, and treating the entire pipeline as one that is learned intrinsically without designing explicit components of, those, of that pipeline. Uh, at the same time, what we often want in this space of driving insight for specific questions is, is some quantity that depends on these individual elements of the pipeline. Now, the problem here is that when you look at the state of the art in NLP right now for these individual elements of the pipeline, you can see that a lot of these tasks have really uh, elevated their accuracies over the past five years in particular. So tokenization by construction, because we're the ones who define what the, the boundaries of tokens are, you know, we can say is 100% accuracy. Uh, POS tagging is now up to about 98%, and, you know, it's been high for a long time. Name entity recognition is now about 93.5%. Uh, syntactic parsing, right, for phrase structure parsing, has gone up to you know, an insane level of accuracy of 96.4 for the F score from working last year, and even co-reference resolution, right? This really challenging problem that involves reasoning about discourse and document level information has also gone up by about 10 points over the past three years in particular. Now, one problem with all of this is that when we look at the state of the art, as we see it within NLP right now, one thing that we all know intrinsically as, as, as you know, researchers within this space is that while these, these state-of-the-art numbers appear very high, we know that there is a very a dirty little secret that we have in LP, that a lot of these numbers work well not just for news, but for the 1989 Wall Street Journal. Right. The Penn Tree Bank is still one of the benchmarks for syntactic parsing, for POS tagging, and even other resources that are built on top of the Penn Tree Bank, right, like OntNotes, uh, are still within this same domain right, for that expand to other tasks. So if we look at the, the kind of attention that these different domains have been getting in our research community, news, of course, has a, a very high um, you know, level of attention being given to it. Uh, Wikipedia, likewise, has an extremely high level of attention, especially in the, in the space of question answering. And there's a long tail of other domains that researchers have been working on to, to, to lesser degrees, right? So uh, more recently, Twitter has also uh, risen as a, as a domain that a lot of people have been working on. There's a longer tail of other languages that are below in, below in their attention with respect to the Wall Street Journal or to Wikipedia, like French and, and Chinese. Uh, but in this tail, right, there exists a long space of individual speakers, or right, individual idiolects that we really want to be able to perform well on in order to be able to derive a measurement for specific linguistic properties about it. Right. And the works of Mark Twain really look nothing like the work of Wikipedia or news or Twitter. And in fact, if we look at the ways in which we see models perform 
form across these different genres. One thing that is in common throughout all of them is an extreme drop in performance. All right, so this here is a meta-analysis of a lot of different work that's examined this disparity be between the accuracy within a domain compared to the accuracy outside of a domain. If you train a model for POS tagging on the Wall Street Journal, you know, according for, to this work from a couple of years ago, uh, the accuracy is 97%. If you take that same model and run it on Shakespeare, the accuracy falls by about 16 points. If you take a German part of speech tagging model, uh, evaluate, train it and evaluate it on modern German newspapers, the accuracy is 97%. Take that same model, apply it to early modern German text, it drops down to about 70%. Take a model for the Wall Street Journal, accuracy is 97.3, uh, evaluated on Middle English, and the accuracy falls by about 40 points. Now, there's no reason why this should work, right? Middle English bears nothing in common with the modern English, but still, people have tried, and we see this you know, catastrophic fall in accuracy. It's true for Italian part of speech tagging, moving from News to Dante, moving from the Wall Street Journal to Twitter for English part of speech tagging, and for named entity recognition. That's true for parsing as well. So even moving between the Wall Street Journal and Genia, between medical text, uh, between the Wall Street Journal and patent data and the Wall Street Journal and magazines, we see a drop in performance across these very similar domains. Right? The, 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 the discourse of magazines is not fundamentally different from the discourse of the Wall Street Journal, but even still, we see a drop in performance by about 12 points. And in many cases, the, the, the kind of drop in performance that we see a, moving across these domains is effectively rendering these tools unusable for the kind of analysis that we want to use them for. So what we want to do here, there's a number of different ways that we can go about accommodating this catastrophic drop in performance. One, of course, is to use work in domain adaptation. Right? There's a long history of work, even within the space of NLP, that's tried to take a lot of data outside of your domain, combine it with a little bit of data within your domain, or even no data at all, to learn how to adapt the parameters of your model so that it performs well in the domain that you care about. We can also use contextualized word representations, right? or even just better representations of words that are not so sensitive to the specific domain in which they're being used, right? This alone can also help improve this kind of generalization performance across these different domains. But in our case, what we care about is having a model that performs really well for literary text in order for us to be able to trust the kinds of results that we get from that. So for us, what we do here, like a third option, the simplest option in many cases, is simply to create more data within that domain that we want to perform well on. So in our case here, what we've done is annotated uh, about 200,000 tokens from 100 different novels that are annotated for the entities that they contain. So the people, the places, the organizations, the events that are depicted as actually taking place within those novels, co-reference between all of those entities, and quotation attribution that marks who the speakers are of all of the quotations that exist within these novels. Now, at this point, all of this data is available for everyone to use on GitHub right now. Uh, I'll put a link up at the very end of this talk if you want to go and download it, but I encourage everyone to go and, and play around with this data and use it as they like. But what I want to do here for the rest of this talk is get at the very end to a case study of how we can use NLP to drive insight for a specifically literary question. But to get that point, what I want to do is, is give you um, uh, some insight into one of these specific problems, right? How we go about understanding how developing more data within our domain really does help us in order to trust the kind of results that are coming out from these kinds of uh, methods that we're developing. And I'm going to focus on this task of entity tagging. Because entities are very important in the context of most literary questions, right? So if you look at the kinds of entities that exist within this very first, uh, uh, this, this opening of Tom Sawyer, Tom, no answer, Tom, no answer, what's gone with that boy, I wonder, you, Tom. Uh, the, the kinds of entities that are mentioned here are all of the characters, right? They're the characters, they are the specific settings in which the characters are interacting. So in here we see an example of characters like Tom, that boy, I, you, the old lady, her, and we see the specific place in which they're interacting in the sense of the room. All right, so in order to be able to derive any kind of more complex representation of plot, of narrative structure, we need to be able to recognize who the characters are and where they're actually performing their actions, where they're interacting with each other. 
Now, one of the issues that we run into in this space is that when we think about entity tagging, the first thing that's going to come to mind is named entity recognition. Right, so most work in LP focuses on extracting named entities. Right, so those mentions of specific categories of uh, you know, people, places, organizations that are explicitly named. All right, so if we take this passage here from Jane Austen's Emma, uh, Mr. Knightley, a sensible man about seven or eight and 30, uh, which in modern English is about 37 or 38 years old, uh, was not only, only a very old and intimate friend of the family, but particularly connected with it as the elder brother of Isabel's husband. NER would pick out Mr. Knightley and Isabella as being the only entities that exist in this passage. However, we know that in the context of characters, there exist many more entities that we really want to be able to reason about. That includes not just Mr. Knightley, but also descriptors, like a sensible man about 37 or 38, a very old and intimate friend of the family, the family as being in a group of people of its own, Isabella, of course, Isabella's husband, and the elder brother of Isabella's husband. Right? All of these are characters that are mentioned. Not all of these have names. Uh, have names. And if we ex extract all these different mentions of these uh, characters, whether they're named or not, this is an important precondition for tasks like co-reference, right? For grouping together all of these different mentions of Mr. Knightley uh, into one entity that gives us a more fleshed out understanding about who that character is and what his qualities are. Also treating the family as being its own unique entity, Isabella and Isabella's husband again as being distinct. So in this case here, what we're doing in order to be able to get at this kind of non-named structure, we are now in the regime of nested entity recognition, because while one of the assumptions that NER makes generally, right, named entity recognition makes, is that entities don't overlap, right? And that makes modeling a lot easier because that means we can treat it as being a sequence labeling problem where every token just has one label, right? B, person, inside person, O, and every other category. When we uh, adopt a more flexible representation about what the entities are, that means entities can be nested. So in this case here, we see Isabella as being a, subs uh, a substring of Isabella's husband, which is itself a substring of the elder brother of Isabella's husband. So in this case, we need to recognize these spans of text that correspond to categories of entities, whether they're named or not. And doing so means we are now reasoning about the kind of hierarchical structure that exists between those entities. So to do this, right, to approach this problem in a way that, that allows us to extract all of these different kinds of mentions of entities, of characters in particular, that we really care about modeling, we built a new data set. We drew 100 books from Project Gutenberg. Uh, and these, so these are all texts that were published before 1924, which was the cutoff for uh, public domain in the US uh, at the time of publication. Uh, and these uh, novels include uh, a, a great variety. So novels that have high literary style, that includes Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, uh, Joyce's Ulysses, along with a lot of popular pulp books. So if anybody here has read uh, uh, King Solomon's Minds, uh, it is essentially Indiana Jones, right? It is, it is the inspiration for Indiana Jones, a kind of swashbuckling tale about uh, an, an, an adventurer here who goes out on, you know, an adventure is looking for archaeological objects. Uh, if anybody has read anything by Horatio Alger, like Rega Dick, uh, they're, they're all pretty much the same. Pretty much every book that he wrote is the same story about a, a young kid who picks himself up by his bootstraps and makes himself in the world. Um, so these are very popular books, right? These were in the you know bestsellers when they were printed, uh, you know, earlier earlier this century in the late 19th century. So for, for this, we selected the first 2,000 words from each text and annotated them for all of the entities that they contain. Now, one thing that dis differentiates literary entities from other kinds of entities that may exist in news text are the kind of figurative expressions that come about in the course of, of a narrative. So one example of that is the, the pervasive use of metaphor. Right. So if you look at the way in which you've seen these kinds of entities being tagged in other kinds of news data sets, they're often in sentences like John is a doctor. Right. So in this kind of copular structure, right, this kind of predicative structure where a doctor is predicated of John, in all of these cases, it's you know, very uncommon to have any kind of difference between the predicate and the subject. Right. In this case, both of these entities are both people. John is a person, 
doctor is a person. In literary text, though, we often see sentences like this. Uh, the young man was not really a poet, but surely he was a poet. So in our case here, we know that the young man is a person. A poet is a person. But what is a poem? Right? Because in this case here, uh, we know that a poem is not necessarily an entity on its own, or right? not necessarily a person entity on its own, the same way that John and the doctor is. In this case here, he is a poem is explicitly predicated of he. Right? The two are being equated as being equal. So are they the same or are they not? Is a poem a person if it is predicated of a person like he? So in our case here, what we choose to do is only annotate these kind of copular phrases whose types denotes a specific entity class. So in this case, we would not treat a poem as being an instance of a person. The other uh, phenomenon that we often see in these kind of literary texts is personification. All right, so this here is a passage from Sewell's Black Beauty. Uh, as soon as I was old enough to eat grass, my mother used to go out to work in the daytime and come back in the evening. Now, if any of you are, have read this book, Black Beauty, uh, you will know that my mother here is a very unique kind of entity because it is a horse, right? I am a horse. And the story is told from the perspective of a horse. So a horse that eats grass, my mother in this case is also a horse. So the question here is, does a horse rise to the level in our annotation of being a person in the same way that humans do in other stories? In our, so for our case, what we decided to do was use this label of person to include characters who engage in dialogue, right, who, who, or who have reported internal monologue regardless of their human status. So that would mean that I and my mother here are both labeled as persons. And also that, uh, you know, in science fiction stories, aliens, robots could also be labeled as persons as well. Right, because if they engage in dialogue or they have some kind of reported internal cognition, uh, we treat them as being characters in a way that would be uh, important for us to be able to get uh, in order to carry out some kind of substantive analysis later on. So in the end, what we end up having is about 12,000 entities labeled across these 100 books. Uh, by far, the most frequent entity that we see uh, in this data are people. That includes uh, common phrases like my mother, a doctor, a fool, his companion. Also, uh, proper names like jarndyce. Facilities include any uh, human-built structure. Uh, that includes the house, the room, the garden, the drawing room, the library, right? These are very important in the context of novels because they give us settings, right? The specific rooms in the house where the action takes place. Uh, natural locations like the sea, the river, the country. Geopolitical entities that include not just named places like London and England, but also unnamed places that still have geopolitical organization, like the town or the village. Uh, vehicles and organizations uh, are, are very sparsely attested in these kinds of novels, but we annotate them anyway. So given this kind of data, we can circle back to that original question, or that question that we had uh, across these uh, this disparity in performance across domains. How well could we have found these entity mentions in text as a function of the training domain? Or did we need to actually carry out this exercise to build this data set to train a model to specifically design and optimize for literature in order to recognize them well? Or could we have just used a model trained on news? To do that, we drew on data that um, uh, from the ACE 2005 data set uh, of, of entities that were annotated in the same way that we chose to annotate ours. Uh, ACE 2005 includes data from Newswire, uh, broadcast news, broadcast conversation, and weblogs. And even just looking at the distribution of entities that we see across these two different data sets, we already see very stark differences. So literature in particular has many more mentions of people than ACE 2005 does, than news does. Uh, news, in contrast, has many more mentions of geopolitical entities and of organizations, while literature, again, has many more mentions of facilities, right, of specific rooms and houses in which we see this action taking place. So even just looking at this difference, this difference in the distribution between the entity classes, we know that there is going to be a big difference between models that are trained on these individual data sets. So to assess this, we took a model that was state-of-the-art at the time, 
the layered bidirectional LSTM CRF from Juvenile 2018 that was state of the art on this specific news uh, data set from ACE 2005. And we went about evaluating the performance difference when we alter the training and test domain. And what we found here was that when we take a model that is trained on news and evaluated on news, right, on the test partition of news, we have an F score of 68.8. When we take that same model and apply it to our literary data set, we see that accuracy fall again catastrophically by about 25 points, right, yielding an F score of 45.7. If, however, we take our model and uh, take a model and train it on the train partition of our literary data set and then evaluate it on that same test, on that same data for the test partition, we see the accuracies again go back up to the same level that it would have for natively trained on news and evaluated on news, right up to 68.3. So we did this uh, a couple of years ago. And then also uh, updated it by incorporating BERT into this model. So even just adding a very specific change, right, a very simple change of replacing the static word embeddings that we used for uh, our previous work with the contextual word embeddings that we get from BERT, we see the accuracy go up by about nine points, right, 9.3 increase in the F1 score, just making this one simple change. So again, this may be because BERT has access to fiction in its pre training that actually gives us a good model of what literature looks like. But again, this is a huge important improvement in performance, just making this one very simple change to the model. Otherwise, everything else here is kept exactly the same. So the F1 score that we have for being able to recognize these kinds of entities in fiction at this point now is 77.6. So given, so on the one hand, we know that training a model natively on literature gives us an increase in accuracy. What we want to understand as well was how, how would, if, what kind of predictions it's making that's different from the model trained on news. So to do this, we tagged a thousand new texts from Project Gutenberg that are using these two different models, right? The one trained on news, the one trained on literature. And we analyzed the difference in the frequencies with which a given string is tagged as a person under both of these models. And what we found here was that the, the, the strings that showed up more frequently as a person under a model tagged with literature compared to a model trained on news included words like Mrs., Miss, Lady, and Aunt. Right, so we can sort of understand what's starting to happen here, right? And looking at the difference between these two different models trained on these different data sources, we're seeing a very strong disparity in gender. All right, and this gets us to you know a bigger a bigger issue that uh, that a lot of these models in LP really need to to reason with and grapple with, and that are the, are the ways in which the models that we have been training on these traditional data sources are also encoding the kind of gender bias that exists within them. Right, so we know already that word embeddings, of course, encode, encode the kind of cultural bias that's implicit in the ways in which people use language already that is then encoded within the text that these models are trained on. And we also know that this kind of bias propagates to downstream NLP tasks. Right? That includes co-ref, uh, includes sentiment analysis, includes speech recognition. And it's not surprising that we would also see it on this level of entity tagging as well, right? When we look at the kinds of texts that these different models are trained on, because when we look at the text from the ACE 2005 data set, right, on the left-hand side here, we can see that it, of course, has lots of mentions of geopolitical figures, right? Presidents like Vladimir Putin and George W. Bush. Uh, comparatively fewer mentions of women compared to men within this data set. On the other hand, when we look at the distribution of characters and entities as we see them in literature, we see much, uh, much more equal representation of men and women as characters within the specific data set. So to make this a little bit more formal in our analysis, we asked here, how well does each model identify entities who are men and women? And to do this, we annotated the gender for all of the people entities in our literary test data, and then measured the recall of each model with respect to these individual entities. And what we found here was that a model trained on ACE 2005 ends up not only having a worse performance, of course, on, on recognizing people at all, right? we already knew this from a couple of slides ago, but also that we see a very stark disparity in performance, right? a, a very strong disparate impact in being able to recognize men compared to women. In this case, we see women, the recall for women is 
points worse than it is for men. While a model trained on these literary texts not only has better performance across the board by right, being able to recognize people entities better overall, but also does not have this kind of disparate impact that we see for news. So overall, this gets to, to one of the reasons why we also want to annotate data for the specific domain that we are then subjecting to analysis, not just having the accuracies be better for recognizing these individual entities, but also so that we're not incorporating other kinds of biases from other data sets and importing those into the kinds of predictions that we're making that we can then uh, that we are then using to draw conclusions from about these kind of literary phenomena. Okay, so this gets us now, let's, let's go back to this core question that we, that we asked at the very beginning. Right? How do we go about designing NLP that can get us to drive insights into literary text? Right? We, we walk through this way of, of understanding why we need to have a pipeline uh, that is specifically optimized for literature. And now we're at the point of trying to use that pipeline to tell us something new about these texts. So the question that we want to ask here is how does information propagate through the networks that we observe in fiction? Right? How does information get from one character to another, to another beyond them, given the kinds of representation of these networks as we see them being uh, depicted within the space of novels? Now, I mentioned here explicitly, or I, I specifically highlight this notion of implicit social networks in the context of fiction and in the context of this research question, because we never directly observe a social network in fiction. This work, of course, is drawing on a much longer research tradition on measuring explicit social, uh, explicit propagation in social networks. And that includes early work on trying to measure information diffusion in blogs, uh, of course, lots of more recent work measuring the spread of rumor and misinformation in social networks, and also other kinds of um, uh, information propagation kinds of uh, questions like measuring text reuse across different legislative bills. Now, in all of this kind of existing work, we see the networks as being explicit. All right, so to take to the context of modeling the spread of rumor and misinformation on Twitter as an example, in that case, we directly observe the nodes the edges, and the acts of propagation, right? We know who the user names are on Twitter. We know when one user follows or is friends with another user, right? So the nodes are observed, the edges are observed, and we can treat an act of propagation in that platform being a retweet action, right? So in that case there, we know that information is propagated when one user retweets the tweet of, a, of another person. Right. Every aspect of this um, question is directly observed there. With fiction, however, we don't directly observe any of these aspects. Right? We don't observe the nodes, the edges, or these acts of propagation. So to do that here, that means we need to build a pipeline for getting at these specific quantities. But to do that first, what we're going to do is define a node as being a character. Right. Again, necessitating this kind of entity recognition from the, 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 the earlier part of this talk. We're going to define an edge to be a conversational interaction that exists between two characters. And we're going to define a piece of information to be an instance of quoted speech. Right? So in the context of great expectations, a character saying Miss Havisham is dead, where an act of propagation here is a repetition of information across at least a character tribe. So A saying to character B, E, Miss Havisham is dead, and B saying to character C, she's dead, where by co-reference we know that she and Miss Havisham are both identical. So the question that we have here is to examine what the structural properties of information propagating nodes are in fiction. Because we might imagine that there's two different alternatives, right? two different hypotheses that we might put forth to explain how information propagates. One, that it, it propagates among close friends and family. Right? What we might think about is, is me gossiping with my, with my brothers and, and parents, uh, nodes that circulate information among a densely connected, strong community. Or we can see information propagating across bridges or through bridges, right? nodes that otherwise be disconnected in the absence of that information bridge. 
So to give an example here from the same network, a gossip in this case would be uh, the close, these kind of tightly bound together communities that have strong ties where everybody knows each other and passes and circulates information among those strong ties. While an information bridge would be an example like this node here, right, that it uh, is connected, is the, the, the single point that links together two different communities. Uh, is it the former or the latter case in which we see information propagating in the context of these kinds of imagined worlds? So to get at this question, we again don't have characters, uh, edges, or, or information be directly observed. So we need to build a pipeline to get at these individual components. And that includes co-reference resolution, speaker attribution, listener attribution, information extraction, and finally an operationalization of these kind of network measures that tell us the qualities of these individual nodes. So let me speak about each of these in turn. So for co-reference resolution, we need this for, for really two main reasons. We need it, first of all, to identify the unique characters that we are then going to use to construct a character network. All right, so to resolve all of the different mentions of Miss Havisham, she, the lady, to each other to see her as being a unique entity within this network. But we also need to identify when two mentions in quotations are referring to the same individual. So she referring to Miss Havisham here, so that we can treat that as being the same kind of information and not information about two different characters. For this, we're using a model trained in our earlier work on, on LitBank that has an F1 score of 68.1 points. Uh, we also need to have speaker attribution, right? So in order to understand who the propagators of information are, we need to know who the quotations were spoken by. So for that, we need to link quotations to their speakers. And for this, we also uh, layered a new um, a new layer of annotations on top of our existing ones for this same set of data that we also uh, annotated for entities and co-reference. And that is the speaker information for all of the 1700 quotations that exist within this data set. Uh, this expands the set of annotated quotation data from three to six novels that people have used in the past to a hundred that exists for all of the novels, the novels in our data set. Right? This has a lot of variety with which we see quotations being used. Right? So not just the quotations that exist within quotation marks, right, the most common form of quotation, but also the, you know, very difficult style that James Joyce has in particular, right, come up, Kinch, come up, you fearful Jesuit, where quotations in all of his works are delimited by or introduced by long M dashes, uh, no quotation marks at all. So all of these are annotated here uh, and carrying out a, a couple of experiments to identify how well we can extract these kinds of speakers and attribute these speakers for quotes. We see that uh, re-implementing the method of Musni et al from a couple of years ago gets a, a, an average um, uh, co-reference metric here of 71.3. So again, we could treat our way of evaluating this as essentially being a co-reference problem where we're trying to identify when two quotations are linked together in the same way that we try to identify when two mentions for co-reference are linked together. Uh, and in this case here too, this here gives you a sense of what the ablation looks like for removing some of the elements of this model. That's not important. One thing I want to point out though is that even having gold co-reference labels for the entities only gets this uh, average score up by about 10 points. So there's a, a much bigger uh, space to improve these models on even beyond just the co-reference one on so. So speaker attribution is important for understanding who the speakers are, but we also need to understand who was present and heard that, that specific quotation. So for that, we built a model for listener attribution, where we try to identify which characters were present when a given quotation was spoken. And to do this, we identified blocks of dialogue where the listeners are all of the characters who are mentioned in the narrative and not in the dialogue. So in this case here, we need to be able to do this in order to know that character C was actually present when character, or sorry, that character B was actually present and heard character A saying Miss Havisham is dead in order to then relate that to character C and not have that be two uh, independent act actions that, uh, that are untied to each other. So given these models for co-ref, speaker attribution, listener attribution, 
We also designed a very simple method for information extraction that just used the syntactic information for, uh, for these predicates and their arguments, where we extracted an atomic unit of information in order to extract, uh, to track its propagation, where we resolve co-reference between all of those entities and then select uh, propositional tuples of the form uh, subject, verb, and object. So in this case here, both of these would be unary relations where Ms. Habisham is the unique entity that is then uh, the subject of the predicate dead. So given this kind of pipeline now, we can get to this, this, this fundamental research question. How are information propagating nodes depicted in fiction once we are able to extract a network using co-reference, attribute all of these quotations to their speakers, identify who was present, and then we can start asking what are these properties of these networks as we've defined them, as we've extracted these kind of implicit networks overall. So to do this, we took, uh, again, it's another portion of data from the Project Gutenberg data set, 15,000 books from this collection, and examined four high precision topics, or right? high, high precision things that people discuss in the context of these novels. And that includes uh, an amorous category that includes um, words like X married Y, hostile uh, that includes X shooting Y, X killing Y, uh, a juridical topic for X being arrested, X being innocent, and a vital category for a given character being alive, sick, or dead. So each one of these topics has at least 100 repeated tuple instances across these different uh, books. And 4,000 of these 15,000 books contain at least one of these repeated tuples, right? So it's relatively broad in its representation for the kinds of fiction that exists, at least within before, published before 1924. Okay, so the question that we're trying to ask now is to, if we have an act of propagation that involves character A saying something to character B, then saying something to character, saying that same thing to character C, character B is the linchpin of this act of propagation. And what we want to understand is what distinguishes successful propagation from unsuccessful propagation, right? How do we know what the qualities are of a character B that lets them successfully propagate information as opposed to an alternative character B who has access to the same information, but then chooses not to? So again, if we take another example of this from another book, um, the Tin Man here says to the Scarecrow, the Wicked Witch is dead. The Scarecrow says to Dorothy, you'll never guess what happened to the Wicked Witch. She's dead, right? Again, the same information that's being identified across these two different instances. We treat this as being an act of successful propagation because the Scarecrow was present when the Tin Man said this piece of information and then chose to propagate it to Dorothy. But let's imagine, however, that the Cowardly Lion was also in attendance when the Tin Man said the Wicked Witch is dead. But while the Scarecrow said to Dorothy, the Wicked Witch is dead, the Cowardly Lion did not. The Cowardly Lion had an opportunity to, because the Cowardly Lion also speaks in this book and in this movie. Uh, but even if it had access to that same information, it chose not to propagate it to another character. So what we want to understand are what are the properties that differentiate the Scarecrow from the Cowardly Lion. And we're going to featureize, we're going to operationalize and represent these characters with a number of different me network measures. Uh, between the centrality, that measures how often do you see this character being the intermediary between information, uh, which, you know, in the context of a network and not specifically within the propagation of information, uh, effective size and efficiency, which measure how redundant their 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 neighbors' net, their nodes, uh, their edges are. Uh, all of these are qualities of information bridges. Uh, we can also measure them, uh, measure the closest centrality, the average neighbor degree, and the number of triangles, which effectively tells us how embedded they are within a closer, more dense network of ties. So to do this, we took 1,730 instances of successfully propagating nodes, paired them with 1,730 instances of non-propagating nodes who had access to the same information but chose not to relay it, and then just used a very simple logistic regression to identify which of these features were meaningful at differentiating the successfully propagating ones from the non-successfully propagating ones. And we're using this to contextualize these results to determine the specific network dynamics that are most important for uh, information propagating in the context of literary fiction.
And what we found here is that when we regress these different outcomes of successful propagation versus unsuccessful propagation, the, the features here that are most strongly associated with a, an active information propagation being successful, according to the measures for an individual that we take, are these uh, features that correspond to information bridges. So efficiency, uh, effective size between the centrality, all have positive coefficients. Efficiency here is significant. And the ones that are more directly tied to that network being uh, embedded within a strongly connected dense one are negative predictors. So in this case, to answer our question here that we initially started with, we can see now that the, the kinds of information, the kinds of qualities of characters that make them good information predictors are the same kind of qualities that make make um, individuals in real social networks also good information uh, propagators, right? The ones who, who bridge together two different uh, disparate communities that, that uh, effectively allows information to flow from one community to the next through that. These are the ones who are important in the context of fiction as well. So this gives us a way of understanding what the qualities are of these implicit social networks and how we can measure what are the qualities of an information propagator that makes them successful or not successful. But when we broaden out our view about what information propagation is, to include acts of explicit propagation, uh, and that includes uh, you know, these kind of sentences where B says in the context of a narrative, in their quotation, A said to me, we could treat that as being an act of propagation where we don't directly observe that very first instance, right? We don't directly observe A saying something to B and B saying something to C. We only see B reporting that A said something to them and then reporting that fact to C. So if we do this here, you know, we have many more instances of this than we do for the acts of implicit propagation that I just discussed. So here we have 93,000 instances. Now we couldn't use this, we couldn't use this method for testing the acts of successful propagation because in this context, we can't actually identify the co-present B nodes who were there during A's initial statement, right, that we could use as being potential propagators, but those who chose not to. But we can still analyze the properties of this kind of network and this kind of active propagation to ask other kinds of questions about it. And the kind of questions that we can ask here are, again, focused on ones about gender in this data set of pre-1924 published books. And that's asking, what the role of gender is in the depiction of propagation. Because there's a lot of theoretical work, uh, especially in the context of literary theory, that examines how women in particular, as characters, are stereotyped as being more likely to engage in gossip, uh, and also as uh, be often being cast as being the intermediaries between two male characters. Uh, so again, lots of theoretical work has examined the ways in which uh, we see women being depicted as these kind of linchpins in, in this kind of information flow. So to get at a measurement about this, right, to see whether or not, to test whether or not these theories are uh, borne out by the kinds of empirical data that we see in our specific data set, what we did was calculate the relative proportions of different gender configurations for all of the triangles that exist within our uh, extracted social network and compare that to the gender configurations for those triads that are involved in propagating information. And if we look at all of the triads, right, the, the, these triplets of characters who are tied together by any act of speaking within our data set, we see a distribution that looks like this, that 16% of these triads triads involve three women, 25% uh, of these triads involve two women and a man, 17% uh, of them involve three men, 18% uh, of them involve two men and one woman. If, however, we look at the same distribution only over these triads that are involved in this act of explicit propagation, we see a very different distribution. And looking at the ones where we see an increase in their relative frequency compared to the baseline case, the, the specific triads that are involved more frequently in propagating this kind of explicit propagation do involve women as being the intermediary here. 
So uh, women, when they are in the middle of propagating information between two women, uh, that that triad shows up uh, more frequently than it does in the baseline case. Uh, and also we see a woman as being uh, the character intermediary that moderates information between a woman and a man. Uh, what we don't see, however, are is the, the work by solicitor at all that sees women as being the intermediaries between men, because that is the only gender configuration in which we see the woman, uh, a woman uh, not propagating information more frequently than we see in the baseline case. Across all of the triads that involve men as being the intermediary, they are less often involved in propagating information than the baseline case. So again, this here gives us a way of understanding women as being depicted in the context of these imagined worlds as being the linchpins of information flow, while also not uh, complicating the analysis here that Solicitor has about them being the intermediaries between two men. So this gives us a new way of understanding the ways in which we can see information propagating, both across what defines an act of successful propagation and across the specific gender configurations in which we see that being constructed within these novels. Um, so I'll point up again that this, there is a lot of all this data is now up on uh, GitHub for anyone to download and, and, and play around with this, uh, themselves. This includes the annotations for entities, for co-reference, for events, and for speaker attribution. I encourage all of you to go and download this work. I also want to leave you with a couple of open directions here that I think this space of cultural analytics intersected with NLP really needs a lot of interesting work to be done within. And I I think because all of you here are, 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 are working very specifically within the space of NLP, maybe some of these ideas may, may capture your attention. So one question here, like one open direction that I think needs a lot more theorizing and empirical work in our field is examining the sociology of literature. Or understanding what the specific social forces are at play both in the production and in the reception of text. Right? How do we go about modeling what kinds of work ends up being published? Right? And how we can understand what the specific contours are of novels that let them be shaped by the specific decisions that publishers and agents have. How do we go about understanding the specific reception that a given work has within the readers who are, uh, who are reading it? Um, we have lots of great open questions here to understand exactly what this interplay is between these two different forces. Uh, lots of questions in born literary natural language processing. Uh, there's lots of challenges and affordances of long narratives for problems like co-reference resolution, question answering, uh, and so on. Uh, on the right here, I give you three books, right? Howard's End, uh, Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves, and The House of Seven Gables. All of these have houses as being an integral part of, the, of their narrative. And the ways in which we can think about co-reference resolution, actually being able to group together a specific mention of a house across 200,000 pages or 200,000 words of a narrative, uh, we know that NLP can't quite do that well now. How do we design systems that can actually get at this for these kind of common entities? And finally, there's lots of questions about narrative. Cartology, right? How do we go about recognizing the individual components of narrative and also assemble them together into a representation of plot, right? Whatever plot is, we know it's a very complex, abstract thing. It has to involve people, uh, the places where they do stuff, the events that they are participating in, along with the time in which they, that all of this takes place. So there's lots of great questions here to ask that I think really do need uh, theorizing from the literary side, but also the kind of sophisticated computational work that you and uh, we are all doing in the space of NLP. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, and thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, I think we have about five minutes for questions. Hi, um, this, oh, go ahead, uh, sorry. Hey, this is Kevin. So, um, thanks for a very cool talk. So, I have just a general question, um, maybe just an open question. So, um, you talk mainly about how NLP can be used to answer literary questions. So I, I assume this is aimed at scholars of the literature. Um, but I'm wondering what your thoughts on whether there's anything for NLP to help consumers, like normal readers of popular oh, yeah. fiction nowadays, like what absolutely. kind of questions are out there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the best places to look at this are in commercial reading devices like the Kindle, right? So if you read a book on the Kindle, there is a a service called X-Ray that uh, that gives you, if you yeah, so 
it lets you under gives you a snapshot about the main characters, where they show up in the context of a narrative, um, what the main uh, ideas are in terms of the kinds of topics that can be linked to Wikipedia articles. Um, and so I think one of the places where you can see the kind of work that is going on in NLP that can help consumers would be in fleshing out this kind of reader experience of books more. Right? Because you can imagine like, one use case here would be well, let's take a, a, an example of a person who is reading a book, puts it down for a year, and wants to pick it back up and, and read it again. What do they need to know about where they left off in order to make them understand and remember everything? Uh, I don't know if this means that summarization on its own would be a good activity to, to incorporate into this reader experience, or if there's specific problems like summarization through a particular point that doesn't also provide spoilers for what's going to happen. That would also be really interesting. But yeah, I think like the, the consumer reading experience for these kind of devices, I think would be the, the, the most natural case where we can actually help people in the act of reading and not just for scholarly analysis. Cool, thanks. Um, I have sort of a, a non-specific question as well, but um, so if I understood the, the the part about information transfer correctly, it seems like the nodes that are these sort of bridge nodes between two groups are really implicated in successful transfers of information. So as a sort of as an interdisciplinary scholar, does that sort of factor into how you see your role as sort of a, a bridge node between two communities or am I reading into it too much? Oh, no, I, mean, I think that I don't think that you would I don't think you could draw that from the specific research. But at the same time, that is also true. Uh, I do think see that this kind of I think that some of the the work that we see arising now in these communities of practice of the computational humanities, computational social science, computational journalism, all involve people who are able to speak across different disciplines, right? To, to give talks in a social science venue and in a computer science venue, or to be able at least to draw ideas from those different communities in order to identify what the research questions are that would be most directly relevant to, to both of them. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I think that as I talk about this work, I'm highlighting the specific aspects of the humanities that I personally find interesting. But there is a much wider community of people in the space of NLP who are doing this for other disciplines like sociology, history, political science, that I think are, are effectively doing the same thing, that information bridges are able to do a kind of research that is able to draw on these different disciplines by virtue of their structural position in their network. Thanks. And yeah, there's lots of opportunity there. OK, I'll ask one. Um, so uh, I noticed that LitBank draws on the first 2,000 words of each of these uh, texts. Um, have you run into any issues with that? I mean, I would imagine that, that it's very idiosyncratic, the first 2,000 words of a document like that. Have you run into like boundary effects that are I mean, particularly for something like information transfer, uh, you might wonder what, how much information can be transferred at first yeah. thousand words of it. So what we've noticed is that the the entity, there are more entities that show up in the first 2,000 words than any other part of the book, right? So characters are introduced for the first time there. So the kind of distributions that we get for the entities themselves are going to be skewed as a function of that. Uh, we also see uh, events showing up more frequently at the end of the book. So in our annotations for the event structure, we again have fewer events that are depicted there, but again gets at issues of representation. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that, so these are all works that are published before 1924. Uh, what we are doing now is expanding LitBank to include 500 contemporary text that includes uh, 100 bestsellers, 100 Pulitzer Prize nominees, 100 works by black authors, 100 works of genre fiction, and 100 works of global Anglophone English. And for that, we are our sampling strategy is drawing four different selections of the text from throughout the book to, again, mitigate these kind of issues that we see from just selecting the very beginning of these ones from the pre-1923 text. So yeah, hopefully that will data will be out, at least for the entities, uh, in a couple of months. Do we have time for one more question? Oh, hey, uh, David, thank you so much for your presentation. 
division. I think it's very impressive. So I'm currently interested in the domain division part. So I'm especially, I want to know when you uh, collect those data from so many different uh, types of books, like those books about the love, about the young, about the adventures or about the social issues. And uh, you, they must have some variations between the uh, genres of the books, right? And uh, did you see any uh, skill distributions between entities in those different uh, categories of books? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, so we didn't, in our case here, I don't think that there exists a single genre of fiction, right? Essentially what we have are 100 individual micro genres where every book is its own genre that is very different in its characteristics from the others. Uh, we didn't actually take any measurements about that would group together the different entities according to the genres because genre is itself a contested category. It's not always easy to put a single label on every one of these books. Um, I would expect there to be differences. And even in just looking at the differences between these historical texts and modern texts, we again see a drop in performance when training the model on pre-1923 text and annotating and, and predicting on post-1923 text. Um, so yes, I expect to see a genre effect there as well. Uh, but I guess our hope is that, that by include by having as many different books as possible, uh, so 100 for these pre-1923 texts and then 500 for the ones that are coming after, uh, we're trying to mitigate that by having more diversity just as a function of the number of different texts that we have. Though still, I think that's not quite gonna get a, a pure solution to that problem. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, David. Uh, I think that a number of us have meetings with you in the, over the next few hours. So um, we'll look forward to those. Great, thanks everyone for having me.